I want you to go with me to the book of Malachi, right in between Malachi and Matthew. It's the very last part of the Old Testament, and right before we begin in the New Testament. So I want you to go to that. Maybe the easy way to find it is go to Matthew, and then go back a page to Malachi. And I want to read just a verse or two from Malachi, and then I want to read a verse or two from Matthew, and then I want to talk to you about the greatest scripture never wrote. Malachi chapter number four. If you are there in your Bible, give me a good amen. amen. Malachi pens these words, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite thee with a curse. Go to Matthew chapter 1. It should be just a page away. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Father, I thank you today for your word, and I thank you for how you work in our life. I pray that this morning you would open up our eyes that we may see spiritually, that we may hear spiritually. And God, we may receive encouragement from the word of God as it works with the Spirit of God to communicate truth into our life. I'll praise you for what you do, and it is in Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. We have read the last of Malachi, and we have read the first of Matthew. There is possibly a page between the two, depending on how your Bible is laid out. Mine has some notes, study notes between the two. And then it says the New Testament. And when you turn that page, you are looking into the Gospel of Matthew. I want to talk to you for just a few moments today about some of the greatest scripture that was never written. Between Malachi and Matthew... There may only be a page in your Bible, but chronologically and historically, there are over 400 years that sit between Malachi and Matthew. This was not Malachi said goodbye, and the next morning Matthew said hello. If you were waiting on the sequel to Malachi, you had to wait a while before it was released. 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Theologians will often call this the silent years because it is in that 400 years between Malachi and Matthew that God does not say a word. Israel had gone into great apostasy they had refuted to a low level of functionality within the confines of their religion. And it was a period of spiritual silence. There were no prophets on the street corner thundering out a fresh word from God. There were no revivals moving through the land where people were coming and giving up their false gods and their man-made idols and seeking Jehovah on a national level. It was a period of silence where God was not speaking, where the heavens seemed like they were made out of brass, where the clouds appeared to be made of iron. And though man was here doing what man does, between man and God, there was a heavy veil of silence. May I ask you a question this morning? Does anybody know what it's like to live through some silent years in your life? Where it seems like 
God is not talking. Where it seems like when you pray, those prayers don't even make it through the sheetrock. Where you look for a word from God, but no matter how much you expect, no matter how much you seek, it just doesn't seem to connect. There were 400 years where scripture was not penned, where prophet did not proclaim, where revival did not rekindle the fire of God in the hearts of the people. But it is in the silent years and it is in that unpinned scripture, in that unwritten story, that on the other side of the silence, I'm going to need a big amen right here, God was still being God. I'm going to make a couple of statements. God's silence is not proof of his absence. Just because God's not speaking doesn't mean that God is not present. And just because God is not active where we can see it, it does not mean that he is absent. I'm going to read a verse, and you don't have to turn there, but it's Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And on Thursday nights, we'll be here soon enough. But I want to reference it because it speaks to that 400 years of silence. Galatians 4 verse 4, Paul said... But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The phrase I want you to see is when Paul said that Jesus came at the fullness of the time. What a beautiful word picture. It literally means this, at the perfect time. It means when everything lined up, when everything was set in the perfect place, that's when God sent His Son. There's several ways you could look at that. How many of you love watermelon? Let me see your hand. And the rest of you, these altars are open. You come, get help today. Jesus loves you as messed up as you are. I like watermelon, but I like it when it's ripe. I like it when it, the heart of that watermelon is just completely full. And when you cut it open, when you put that knife in that rind and you make that first cut, you hear the watermelon scream out softly, eat me and eat me now. It's ready. It is ripe at the fullness of time. Those of you that have gone through childbirth, it's a very traumatic thing. I almost didn't pass out when Miss Amy had a doctor. But you know that that baby is coming in the fullness of time. When it is ready. When everything is where it is supposed to be. It cracks me up. We'll have young couples and they'll call and say, "Uh, we're going to go in in the morning and they're going to induce labor at about 5 a.m. So we ought to have a baby come 6, 6 6.30 or 7. (laughs) And I want to say, you mean tomorrow evening? (laughs) Because you can do whatever it is you do. It's still going to take the perfect time. Now, God is working even when we are waiting. Things are not happening the way that we may want them to. Things may not be moving along like we thought they would. This is the heart of the message today. Just because God is silent does not mean that He's absent. And just because God is not active does not mean that He is absent. He is working while we are waiting. I I was studying this and then it was like two or three things fell into order 
just into my path and I thought, well, I have to preach it. Do you know that between Malachi and Matthew, between the prophecy that John Baptist would come with the spirit of Elijah and then the appearing of Christ in Matthew 1, did you know that in those 400 silent years and what is not penned in Scripture and what is not recorded within the confines of our Bible, in that 400 silent years, God was doing a work and God was setting things in order and God was bringing about the fullness of time so that when Jesus came in Matthew 1, he would not be premature, he would not be late, but Jesus would show up right on time. Let me give you a quick historical reference to five things that happened between Malachi and Matthew. How many of you remember from school and your history lessons a man by the name of Alexander the Great? Does that ring a bell with anybody? I don't know what you have to do to get the great tacked on as your nickname, but I'm going to research that. Amen. I guess conquer the world would do. And that's what he did. Alexander the Great, in that 400 year period of time, he conquered the world as it was known. But he did more than conquer the world as it was known. He did something in his, in his rule and in his reign that changed the shape of the world. He instituted a common language. And Alexander the Great brought Greek to the world and almost every continent and almost every people and almost every nation began to speak, understand, and use the Greek language. Alexander the Great did that. You think they could have called him Alexander the Greek? Can I get an amen? But he was the great. And he brought to the world one central language, and that's the Greek language. During this time... In that 400 years where it seems as though God is not doing anything, the Old Testament, all of your Old Testament prophets, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all of those great historical Old Testament books, do you know what happened to them between Malachi and Matthew? They were translated out of Hebrew into Greek and it was simultaneous as the world under Alexander the Great is learning to speak fluently Greek and in that 400 years God allowed the Old Testament which had always been in Hebrew to be carried into the Greek language and around 280 years before the birth of Christ the Old Testament was available completely in the Greek language. There was a third thing that happened in that 400 years. A man by the name of Socrates shows up. And he introduces a method of learning that probably most of us experienced growing up. And his method of learning was far and away different than the traditional method of learning. The traditional method of learning was through the spoken word. And someone would recite a lecture. Someone would recite a story. Someone would tell the facts as they knew it. And the students would sit from the little children all the way to the great uh, philosophers and learners and students of the day. And they would sit silently as someone else poured into them. But Socrates introduced a method of learning that involved questions and answers. Where now no longer did pupils just sit and listen, but now they would ask questions. They would dig deeper into what was said. And no longer did they just take what someone else said and accept it as true, but now it was questioned. Now it could be refuted. 
Now there had to be backing and there had to be facts and there had to be logic that backed up those lessons. In 63 B.C. something else happened. The Romans conquered the Greeks and claimed control of the world. Now here's why that matters. Because the Greeks brought to the world basically one language that was used around the globe. But when the Romans conquered the Greeks, there was an unusual period of peacetime in the world where wars were not breaking out, where people were not fighting every day just to survive. There was an unusually long peacetime in the world. So do you know what the Romans did during that extended period of peacetime? Well, now they're not trying to run around and kill everybody, so they got a little time to catch up on the to-do list. And what was on their to-do list? Let's build roads. Let's build highways. Let's build shipping ports. And let's connect the world through means of transportation where now we're no longer just isolated behind the little walls of our kingdom because we're afraid that somebody's going to come kill all of us and take what we have. But now because there is peace, they're building the Romans' road. They're extending shipping lanes. They're establishing ports of travel. And now people that had been confined to one tiny little place, now the world is at their fingertips. They can walk out of their house and uh, theoretically they can be anywhere because there is a road or a boat that goes there. That was, un, that was unprecedented. That was never the case until 63 B.C. when Rome began to connect the world through transportation systems and infrastructure. Something else happens in those, 500 ye- in those 400 years. It's called the dispersion of the Jews. The Jews had lived within the confines of Jerusalem. They had stayed for the most part around Jerusalem. It was a safe place. That's where they were gathered up and bundled up and their safety in numbers. My preacher, Brother Brown, used to say it like this. The safest place for a banana is with the bunch because if you get off by yourself, you're about to get peeled. Somebody say that. <laughs> That's some of that deep theology I was raised on. So the Jews lived in a bunch. But now, against their will, they're dispersed out of Jerusalem. And they're, they're, they're moved all over the world. And they're sent to continents that they've never been to. They're put in communities that they never would have chosen to live in. But yet the dispersion of Jerusalem placed the Jews literally all around the world. Now I want to back up and run through these real quick. Do you see that in those 400 years where man says God is silent, God's not moving, God's not speaking, God's not working, the heavens are brass, the clouds are iron, God, where are you and what are you doing? Between Malachi and Matthew, I'm about to have a spell this morning, Alexander the Great puts a central language in place in the world. The Old Testament which was locked down in Hebrew, was translated into that central language. People no longer sat and listened and took it for fact, but now they questioned, they probed, they interacted with their lectures. Then Rome puts in roads and shipping ports that connect the world, one continent, one city, one kingdom to the other. And then God used uncomfortability and persecution to push the Jews out of Jerusalem down those Roman roads, on those Roman ships, and they are going to places that speak Greek, that have a Greek Bible, that now they are dispersed as missionaries all over the world. And for the first time in history, not only are they out of their comfort zone, but they have the ability to share with others what they never would have understood had there not been a central language and the Bible put in that central language. Isn't that amazing? And then... 400 years of silence and the fullness of time 
and God the Father and God the Holy Ghost agreed that it was time and Mary was overshadowed and in the womb of that young virgin girl she conceived the Son of God and it had to happen when it happened. Come on somebody. Or it wouldn't have happened like it happened. Isn't that amazing? Now, there's no, <laughs> there's, there's no book on that. There's no chapters and verses consolidated or assigned to that. It's unspoken. Matter of fact, without the help of thousands of years of history, it would be unknown. No one living between Malachi and Matthew understood that. Nobody said, oh, I see what he's doing. The Romans are building roads because the Bible is now in a common language and I get it now. Nobody had that understanding. But how many of you know that whether we understand it or not, whether we see it or not, whether we comprehend it or not, God is good at being God and he is working while we are waiting. I said all of that to tell you this. Somebody's sitting here today and you feel like you're living in your silent years. Maybe one chapter is closed and another one hadn't yet opened. And you say, God, where are you? Lord, why aren't you moving? Why aren't you blessing me? Why aren't you promoting me? Why aren't you sending me what I'm asking you for? And while your prayers go unanswered, somebody hear the preacher, God is still working. And while it seems like you're an outcast from the will of God, God is still working. And you may not see it. And can I just go on and preach a minute? You may never see it. You may never have the luxury of history to look back at those silent times, but just know this, whether you see it, understand it or not, when God was silent, he was not absent. He's working right now. He's working. I think of the times in my life where God was silent, but yet (laughs) he was working. We were meeting in a little feed store where the Dollar General is now. I got any full-time residents of Clover Valley in the house of God this morning? If you don't know what Clover Valley is, you're a little too bougie for us. I'm just going to tell you. A little too bougie. But where the Dollar General is now, what Brother Josh Harrington called the yellow store. I like that. There was a feed store, and we were renting, and it was going to be a purchase. We were going to buy that corner in that property and when they appraised it it was just astronomical what they wanted for it and the building was dilapidated it was just right at two acres and just no way that we could have done anything there that made sense and so we began to pray I remember kneeling in my little corner office in that feed store and saying oh God I know that you want us to have a place I know that you want us to have a permanent home. I know that you want us to have a building and a property and a facility that we can use from here on out. But I had no direction. I remember going to the courthouse in Hamilton and pulling the phone number of every person that owned property on Gray Rock Road. And I went right down the list. This is Brother Jonathan McNeese from Greater Life Baptist Church. And I see where you own X amount of acres. And I was just asking if you were interested in selling any of it. And one after the other, after the other, after the other was no, not interested. How'd you get my number? Are you a stalker? Don't worry about that. We're just trying to build a church. I called the fella that owns this land between us and Highway 27 that same spiel. And he said this. He said, oh, yeah, I do. I, I, I do have some property that I'd love to sell y'all. I said, praise God. It's answered prayer. He's the only one that said yes. Sometimes it's not hard to figure out the will of God. <laughs> Come on now. You get 99 no's and one yes. Thank you, Jesus. He's a moving. He's speaking. I feel it, Lord. Me and Brother Terry came. We walked 
When you come down our driveway, if you're coming down the driveway, I know some of y'all do 85 down the driveway, so you don't really know what's on both. But if you'll slow down to around 60, you'll see, you'll see, do we need an invent right now? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I see those hands, I see those hands. To your right, coming down the driveway where those trees are, that was the property that was made available to us. It's two acres. It starts on the dirt road and it comes all the way down basically where our light is out there that power pole it comes down and it's shaped like a piece of pizza and it drops we had it surveyed it drops from the road down to where the back corner is it drops 68 feet in elevation I was so optimistic. I said, asked Brother Terry, I said, man, we're going to have a basement out of this world in that new building. <laughs> and so we put a contract on that two acres with an almost 70-foot drop from front to back. I think the asking price on it was like it was 30000 an acre, and it was like sixty five or 66000 we were going to give for two little bitty acres. But that was the only door that would open. And so we did. We had 90 days. And we started saving money. I'll never forget this. We went into a financial meeting. And I sat down. The fellow that was doing the finances at the time. I said, all right. I said, shoot me straight. How much do we have in the building fund? He pulled the paperwork. Ran the numbers. Pulled his glasses down to his nose. He said, preacher, evidently they charge you for having an account with no money in it. We're negative five in the building fund. I said, praise God, I got the first five. Who'll join me? Who's next? We didn't have nothing. Somebody said, y'all start from scratch. Honey, we didn't even have nothing to scratch when we started. <laughs> nothing. We started praying. And God started bringing the money in left and right. Within the church, outside the church, places I'd preach. I mean, it was just insane how God was just bringing in what we needed. We were so excited about our little piece of crooked pizza-shaped property. I was sitting in my office up there in that feed store, and I knocked on the front door of the building. I went to open it up, and it was Leroy that lived in that little white house up there. That's what he said. He said, Preacher, he said, I know I told you that we didn't want to sell any land. He said, but I was... My wife and I were doing dishes, and he said we were looking out the window, and he said they were surveying that two acres next to us. He said, and when we seen them driving those stakes in, he said, I looked at her and said, you know, we're going to have to sell it sometime. We might as well sell it to that preacher. I said, well, Leroy, what, what, what do you have? What are you thinking? He said, we've got 12 acres that we'll let go and he said, you can have it for $72,000. I said, that sounds like a better deal <laughs> than the church with the world's greatest basement. <laughs> we were able to void our contract on that two acres. And we were able to purchase this 12 acres right here instead. See, and that was it. Listen to me. That was in year five of Greater Life being a church. We had been in living rooms. We'd been in our living room. We had been at the Hampton Inn conference room. We had been in storefront buildings. We had been in a feed store. And for five years, I looked around and said, God, what are you doing? Where are you? We need a place. And God opened a door and we went down it. And it wasn't even the door that we would ultimately walk through. But God took that door to open another door. And you're sitting right now on 22 and a half acres that God put into our life. Amen. Amen. <laughs> While we are waiting, God is working. And you can't see it, but that don't mean it's not happening. And I'm, I'm trying to help some of y'all. You may never understand it 
And that's okay. You don't have to understand it. As long as God does it, that's the only thing that matters. One of my closest friends when I was a teenager on up into my early 20s was a young man that was born into a family that could not and would not take care of him. And as an infant, they took him and they put him up for adoption. They turned him over to an orphanage. A family came and chose him and adopted him and they carried him home. They were just simple, really poor country folk from North Florida, out in the country. I'm talking about people from Florida, still ain't never seen the beach, that part of Florida. Y'all know what I mean? Anybody? <laughs> no, nothing. It's true. It's there. They're there. Just farmers. That little boy grew up in that home. They had no church connection, didn't know Christ, didn't even claim to know Jesus, had no church affiliation, and he grew up in that home and in that family. One day, a preacher came to the little trailer, single wide trailer they lived in, knocked on their door and asked that little farm boy, would you like to go to church? And he said, I would. And they started taking him to church and that little adopted orphan boy got saved in that church. God began to work in his life and when I met him, he's a few years older than me, when I met him, he had already not only been saved but called to preach. But he was so shy, so backwards, so bashful, the kind of guy that you call him by name and he'd just look at the floor and turn red. You know, one of them, one of them that wouldn't even want to lead in silent prayer. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I mean, just terrified of people and speaking. But God had called this little farm boy to preach. We went to college together. He was so faithful. He wasn't exceptionally intelligent or smart, smarter than everybody else, but he, he, he kept his nose on the grindstone and he worked hard and he went to college and he made the grades and he graduated in the little church that he had gotten saved in. They brought him on as their assistant pastor. He was growing in grace and growing in the Lord and in time the pastor that had hired him resigned and God moved him to another ministry and this farm boy preacher found himself in a place that he'd never been before. His world was kind of turned upside down and seemed like God had put all this together and what now? I was in college in Victory over in North Augusta, South Carolina and he called me and he said, I'm going to come up and visit with you. And so we did. He came up and spent the weekend with Amy and I. And while, while he was there, he had been praying all these years that God would send him a wife and a godly woman. But I'll just give you a little pro tip. It's hard to meet a wife when every woman you see makes you stare at the floor and turn red. <laughs> Wouldn't even speak to him. But he came to visit us and his life was just kind of in limbo. Didn't know where he was going to go, what he was going to do. He came, visited us. And around that time, he had taken a missions trip to Mexico. And while in Mexico, in this period of limbo, he felt like God was calling him to be a missionary to Mexico. I'm talking about a little redneck boy who couldn't speak English, let alone Spanish. Let alone Mexican. Come on, y'all. <laughs> but he, he felt like that's what God wanted him to do. And I remember, listen, I remember when he told me that. I remember thinking, <laughs> you need to be real sure about that. You know what I mean? You ever had somebody tell you what God's doing? You're like, I'm not telling you God's not doing that. I'm just telling you, you need to double check with heaven. <laughs> he came, visited us, and came back and forth a little bit from Florida. And in that time... What he didn't know was there was a young lady there his age who had had a lot of health problems, had struggled with some things that limited her life. and She'd never had a boyfriend, never had a serious relationship, and she too was praying that God would send her the right kind of man to be a husband. They served the Lord together. Well, he meets her. 
And they're talking after church one day, and he says, so what, what do you do for a living? <laughs> she says, I teach Spanish. <laughs> and they fell in love. And this morning, they're celebrating probably 20, so I've been here 20, they, they're celebrating close to 25 years of planting churches and working in Mexico to bring people to Christ. And I lived with Jason when we were in college in Florida together. And I watched him pray those prayers. And I watched him say, God, what's next? And I watched him fast and pray and, and stay close to God. But yet it seemed like all those years that nothing was happening. But while God was working on a farm boy from Florida... God was working on a Spanish teacher from South Carolina. And, and, and the only Spanish word I can think of to describe it is caliente. <laughs> I hope that means what I think it does. I may have just cussed. I don't know. Give me grace. I do know, I do know Chalupa. I'm very familiar. I'm very familiar with tacos. Okay. But I'm trying to show you. While he was down there wondering where's God. She was up there wondering where's God. And all the time God was plotting their path. So that in the fullness of time. When he was called there. She was prepared to go. But it was in the fullness of time. <laughs> can, I, can I just preach another 30 seconds. Abraham and Isaac are going up Mount Moriah. And Abraham is going to take the life of his son Isaac. And Isaac says, Daddy, I see the wood and I see the fire, but, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, Son, all I know is God told us to go and he'll provide a lamb. And the Bible tells us when they got to the top of the mountain that there was a ram caught in the thicket waiting on top of the mountain. And I always imagine this picture that Abraham and Isaac are coming up this side of the mountain and on the other side of the mountain, God was leading a ram to the top. And while they were going that way, God was bringing the ram the other way. And in the fullness of time, they connected on the mountain. I mean, if you know famines don't just happen overnight, that famines happen when there's waste, when there's agricultural mispractice, there's a whole host of weather patterns that have to come in order for there to be a famine. And I think about the life of Joseph, how he had a dream and a vision, but he ends up in a pit, then he ends up in slavery, then he ends up in prison. And while God was allowing Joseph to sit in prison where there's no answers, where there's no miracles, where there's no open vision, where there's no powerful word from God while God was bringing Joseph down the path there was a famine that was ticking in in Egypt and by the time the famine hit Joseph was in the house of Pharaoh was that my timer? y'all are a hateful bunch you know that? security it's the guy in the back take him on out Jesus in the womb of Mary. You know who had to come before Jesus could come? John the Baptist. <laughs> John the Baptist was a gospel bulldozer. He didn't come in wearing a three-piece suit and Armani shoes and a $300 buffalo shoulder leather Bible. John Baptist came out of the wilderness wearing camel hair, chewing on locusts with a honeycomb in his hand. And he said, all y'all wicked, all y'all going to hell, and the only hope you have is if God don't kill you. He was a real smooth minister of the gospel. <laughs> John had to come before Jesus could. Mary with Christ in her womb, said, I need to go see my cousin Elizabeth. He said, I need to tell my cousin Elizabeth what the Holy Ghost has revealed to me. And Mary walks in the house. And when she walked in the house, Elizabeth said, how are you? And what Mary didn't know was that down in Elizabeth's womb was a little baby boy who was already getting pre-fit for some, for some infant-sized camel hair overalls. 
and little John Baptist was in Elizabeth's womb and when Mary walked in, John leapt in the womb of Mary. John, as an infant, jumped up and down in the womb of, his, of Elizabeth because he could sense the presence of Christ in the womb of Mary. <laughs> and at the fullness of time, God did what God knew needed to be done. I'm trying to tell every last one of us that just because he's silent doesn't mean he's not active. And just because you don't see his activity doesn't mean that he's not present. You keep praying. You keep trusting. And you'll find out one day that while you were coming up this way, God had your answer coming up the other.